Good morning, everybody. I, I hope you're doing well for this last day of this JSI conference. On uh, behalf of the organization committee, I'm uh, glad um, to introduce our first speaker, uh, keynote speaker of this morning, Diara Fall. Uh, from my point of view, uh, Diara Fall is a perfect uh, GSI profile. <laughs> Uh, she started um, in uh, theoretical mathematics, then sh she continued in, uh, she moved to data uh, processing, and in particular she worked in CEA. CEA is a um, French Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and then she moved to uh, statistics and, and uh, numerical analysis, and now she's affiliated to the University of Orléans. Uh, she's a uh, leader of uh, two projects uh, called Pianica and Cournier, whose aim is to understand brain activities. So today she will talk about mathematics and medicine, and I'm glad to hear what she has to say to us. Your, the stage is yours, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, I would like first to thank the organizer for inviting me. For me, it's a great pleasure and uh, a big honor to be here. So thank you for this kind invitation, and I hope you, you enjoy this, uh, this nice conference. So uh, uh, as Barbara said, I am, I am very interested in, uh, in the application of mathematics, uh, particularly for medical imaging. So I'm going to talk uh, about that. So here is the outline of my talk. Uh, I don't know if everyone here in this room is uh, familiar with uh, Bayesian uh, parametric and non-parametric, so I'm first going to, to make an introduction to, to introduce this term. After that, I will, uh, oops, sorry. After that, I will present a uh, study, so uh, research. Um, I met with some uh, neurologists at uh, Orléans Hospital about uh, Bayesian non-parametric and uh, Bayesian parametric. Uh, after that, I will move to image reconstruction before, uh, and so I will end with the conclusion and, uh, and perspective of this, uh, of this job. Okay, so let me now move to the introduction about parametric versus non-parametric. To me, a parametric model is a model in which the number of parameters is fixed or bounded by a constant with respect to the sample size. Okay, so this is the definition of a parametric model. And uh, in a non-parametric model, the number of parameters is not fixed, so it can, uh, it can dynamically grow with the data and their structure. Alternatively, we say that a model is non-parametric if the parameter is uh, infinite dimensional. So typically, when we have a function, for example, a probability density function, a cumulative density function, or a regression function. So when you have a function as uh, a parameter, your model is uh, uh, non-parametric, okay? So in a parametric model, the number of parameters is fixed. And in a non-parametric model, the number of parameters is, uh, can be uh, infinite dimensional. So I have two examples. The first is the regression model. So we have observation x and y, x from x1 to xn, and y from y1 to yn. And we are interested in the relation between y and x. So. In a parametric framework, we model this as follows. So we have y equals f of x parameterized by beta. So our parameter is here the vector beta, so of size p plus one. And uh, here, the variance of the error. So our parameter is, uh, is just a vector, okay? So for example, if you have a linear regression, your parameter are uh, here the regression co co coefficient, beta zero and beta one, okay? Or for example, a polynomial regression. In uh, all of these cases, your parameter is, 
of finite dimension. Okay. So, oops, sorry. In a non-parametric framework, okay, the parameter is the function at itself. Okay. So in a parametric framework, here the parameter is the vector beta. In a non-parametric framework, the parameter is the function f itself. So the only assu assumption we put on f is uh, some uh, some assumption of smoothness. Okay. Uh, the second example is the density estimation problem. So we have observation x from x1 to xn that are IID with some cumulative distribution capital F. And we want to estimate the, the density. So that is the derivative of the, um, of the cumulative F. In a parametric framework, we uh, can assume that F belongs to some parametric family, typically a Gaussian family that is parameterized by the mean and the covariance matrix, for example. Or you can, uh, for example, assume that uh, your density is a finite mixture model. So in this case, your parameters are your, the weights, the parameters here, and the number of components. Okay. But you can see in uh, these two cases, your parameter is uh, of finite dimension. In the non-parametric framework, you just say that, so your parameter is your density f, and it is a probability density function, okay? With the assumption that it is a probability density function, so it comes to one, it is positive, etc. okay? Or alternatively, you can consider a infinite mixture model, okay? So in this case, you are non-parametric. And the last example is the clustering problem in which you are interested in partitioning object into, uh, into clusters. So in a parametric framework, the number of clusters is finite. In a non-parametric framework, this number is uh, potentially infinite. Okay, so I hope now you are familiar with this notion of parametric and non-parametric. I think it is uh, interesting to define them. Let me now move to the Bayesian. So, so I'm going to talk about Bayesian non-parametric. So I first want to introduce non uh, parametric versus non-parametric and Bayesian. So a Bayesian model assumes that the parameter is a random quantity. Okay. So what does it mean? So again, the example of the density estimation. We have data x1 from xn, and we want to estimate the density. I consider here just a parametric framework. We have the parameter theta. Uh, when we are Bayesian, we need three ingredients. The first is a prior. Okay. We put a prior over the parameter. So here we put a prior over theta. We put a prior over theta, so that is pi. We consider the likelihood, the joint distribution of the data that is seen as a function of the parameter. And we compute the posterior using a bias theorem. Okay, so compute the posterior, you need the prior here and the likelihood. So, and uh, this term. So, if you have this posterior or uh, an estimate of this posterior, you can compute as an estimate of theta, you can uh, consider the posterior mean. That is the optimal estimator with respect to quadratic loss function or the maximum a posteriori uh, that is the optimal estimator with respect to Bregman divergence. So in this nice paper by uh, Marcelo Pereira, so consider some aspect of uh, differential geometry to show that. Or for example, you can consider another estimator like, uh, like superior median, okay? So being Bayesian, all uh, the inference about the parameter lies on the posterior distribution. Okay, now uh, what is a Bayesian non-parametric model? It's a Bayesian model on an infinite dimensional parameter. Okay, so we have again this example. So in a problem of a density estimation, you are interested in a density. So the parameter space is the set of continuous probability distribution. In a regression uh, problem, uh, the parameter space is the set of smooth functions 
and in a clustering problem, that is the set of the partition function. So we need to put prior on function. So we say that here f is distributed according to calligraphical f, when this calligraphical f is a stochastic process. So a stochastic process is just a distribution on the functional spaces whose sample graph are function. So the stochastic processes form the core of many Bayesian non-parametric models. Okay, we need to put prior and on function, so we need the uh, stochastic processes. You have here some example of stochastic processes: the Gaussian process, whose realization are continuous function; the Dirichlet process, one of my favorite uh, um, Bayesian non-parametric models. Uh, but the, reali the real realization are discrete uh, probability measures, so they do not admit density. Uh, we can consider this the process mixture. So if you are modeling, uh, for example, uh, a density. And uh, today I'm going to talk about polyatry. So it's also one of my favorite uh, Bayesian non-parametric models. Uh, what is interesting is uh, in polyatry is that you can parameterize your tree to, uh, so if you want to have discrete or continuous probability measures. Okay. And now I'm going to talk about this, uh, this study. So that is a Bayesian non-parametric test for the study of uh, language areas in stroke pressure. Uh, so that's a research I have made with some uh, neurologists at, uh, at our Lion Hospital, okay? So let me now just introduce the context of this work. Uh, I'm going to talk about language pathology. So it is worth mentioning that this language pathology is a common and a serious defect after, after stroke. Um, according to epidemiological studies, nearly 25 to 30% of stroke patients develop such a defect, okay? So the aim of this work was to identify the brain areas that are involved in these, uh, in these troubles. So what I am going to, to call the language areas. So to do this, there's a reference method in the medical literature that is called the voxel-based Lucian symptom mapping. Uh, the procedure is as follows. Uh, there are two steps. In the first two steps, so we have N acute ischemic stroke patient. Uh, in the first step, they uh, undergo uh, imaging, so that is typically uh, MRI. So we have here, let me show you here, we have here the 3D T1 image that is used to identify the lesions, and the lesions are delineated here on the diffusion image. Okay. And uh, here, for example, you have an MRI with a lesion that is here. And since uh, all the patients do not have the same brain, so this image are uh, normalized with respect to a need a, um, an ideal brain, and we obtain what we call a mask. A mask here is just a binary image, okay? For example, uh, so we have just here in white the lesion, okay? So this is the first step. This is the first step, and so this is what I mentioned. So we have the lesion map, of uh, each of the patients. In the second step, the patients are evaluated with the language screening test, that is a neurological test. In this test, there are two subscores. The first is a exp expression score, and the other one is a receptive score. So the total sum of the score is considered, and uh, the maximum is uh, 15, and if the score is less than 15, the patient is ranked as uh, symptomatic, so what is uh, in the aphasic here. So why? In the last test, there are these two parts. In the first part here, for example, the patient must give a name to some object. For example, here, he must say that this is a pencil, this is a television, uh, uh, knife, etc. So this is the, the um, expression part, and in the receptive part, he must designate here, for example, the object. So to designate here the tomato, or for example, execute, uh, perform some tasks like touching the ground, etc. Okay. So if the patient fail in this 
test, it means that uh, he's a phasic. So we have these uh, two things, the, the, the image of, uh, of patients like lesions and the, la and the score to the LARC test. So using this, uh, statistical tests are performed voxel by voxel, okay? And the object is to identify the, con the voxel which controls the language, so what we call the, um, the language array. So the aim of this work uh, with, uh, with Dr. Ozu was first to confirm or refute the implication of the classical language arrays using this test, the LARC test, and so what he asked me is to know if it is possible to reduce the number of patients that are included in, uh, in his uh, study using a different statistical approach, okay? Because it was difficult so to, to obtain this patient, so he asked me if it is possible to develop a new method to, to this aim. Okay, so uh, let me begin with some notation. Uh, let y from y1 to yn denote the last two score of n patients, and g is the number of voxels. Um, so in each voxel j, so, and each patient n, I can define a binary variable, uh, z and j, that is equal to one if voxel j in patient number n is lesion, and uh, zero otherwise. And yn is the score to the last test. So that belongs to so between zero and 14, if patient N is aphasic, and uh, that is uh, 15 otherwise. So in each voxel J, we can partition the patients into two groups, group one and group two, uh, with one denoting uh, the patient so to have this voxel le uh, lesion. So here, y, uh, Y1J, is the set of score of patient whose voxel number J is lesion, and NYJ is the cardinality of this set, and the same for y, Y2J. So this is a, a test problem. Why? Because we are interested just in whether the two groups, we have two groups, in, ways, in, in whether these two groups are dif uh, different or not. So, I can write this as then, y1j, uh, so this vector, we have a set of samples that is distributed according to f1, and the same uh, for y2j, distributed according to f2, uh, where these two functions are unknown, and we consider in each voxel just these two competing hypotheses, h0, these two distributions are equal, versus they are not. This is a two sample comparison problem. So significant voxels such, such, such that H0 is rejected are considered as belonging to language area. So this is a two sample comparison problem that is performed in the medical literature using student t-test. But you may know, I hope, that if you use a student t-test, you are assuming some normality. So you have to check if this normality is, uh, is met or not. Or, for example, an idea that are big enough using the central limit theorem. Okay. Uh, alternatively, you can use a non-parametric test, uh, a frequentist non-parametric test, like Man Whitney or Kolmogorov Smirnov. And I propose to use uh, a Bayesian non-parametric test. So, just before uh, mentioning, uh, just let me mention this. Uh, the difference between a uh, frequentist and a uh, Bayesian uh, hypothesis testing. So when you perform a frequentist test, uh, you do not assign probability to your hypothesis, but rather to the statistic of the test. Okay, so the statistic of your, the test is your random variable. So p-values are often mistaken for probabilities of hypothe uh, hypothesis. Okay, a p-value is not a probability of a hypothesis. I have a hypothesis. So a p-value measures agreements of your data with the model that is postulated by H0, but not the probability of H0, okay? Because you are frequentist, you are not assigning a probability to your hypothesis. In contrast, when you perform a Bayesian hypothesis testing, 
So your hypothesis assign probable prior distribution. So, and uh, you can just choose the largest hypothesis with the, with the largest posterior probability. So it is conceptually straightforward to, to understand and to, and to explain. I think there, there are a lot of people who do not really understand what is a p-value, so. <laughs> so here is the Bayesian hypothesis testing. So we consider these two hypotheses, H0 and H1, okay? And we want to assign a prior probability to this hypothesis. To do this, we consider a prior density phi of theta, and we can compute the prior of H0 and H1. That is just given as follows, okay? So this prior is phi zero, and uh, the prior of uh, H1 is uh, phi one, okay? So you have these two prior probabilities, and you can judge your two hypotheses using what is called the prior odds ratio, that is just phi zero over phi one. So this is the first step, okay? In the second step, so you know when you are Bayesian, once you observe your data, you update your belief about the parameter using the posterior distribution. Uh, so you have this posterior density, and you can compute the posterior of each of the, of the hypotheses, so posterior of H0 and those of H1. So this is P0 and P1. And so you also update your, your hypothesis using now the posterior odds ratio, that is P0 over P1. And we use what we call the bias factor, that is just the ratio of the posterior odds to the prior odds, so that is given uh, by this expression. So the bias factor um, is the measure of the evidence that is provided by the data in support of, uh, of H0. And we also have this link between uh, the posterior probability and the bias factor. And now, so the test I propose is uh, based on a Bayesian non-parametric. So as I mentioned, because I am Bayesian, I put prior on the, on the unknown, okay? And my unknown I are functions, okay? So I have two, two set of subsamples. The one is distributed according to F1 and the other to F2. So I put prior on this function and I am non-parametric, okay? And the prior are polyatry. So now I'm going to define after what is a polyatry. But why? Just to motivate this, um, this choice. So I have already mentioned that. When uh, performing a Bayesian test, allow to have a clear interpretability of, uh, of what you are doing as compared with the uh, p-value. And also something that is very, in that is very important. So a Bayesian approach is not based on asymptotic. So it allows to, can, uh, to handle sm small sample size. As I mentioned, so the neurologist asked me if it is possible to reduce the number of uh, patients. So uh, that's why also I consider this Bayesian approach. And uh, a non-parametric test because the polyatry allows to center the probability distribution, I'm going to mention this after, at a given parametric model. So this allows to, to embed this parametric model in a, large, in a larger non-parametric one. Okay, so what is a polyatry? Uh, polyatry are specific distribution on probability measures. So there are natural candidates for prior on probability uh, measures. You have this nice paper, so that are very technical <laughs> papers, but uh, you have this nice paper for about uh, polyatry. Uh, this paper by Dobbins, Friedman, Fabius, uh, and Kraft. Okay. And uh, the name polyatry appears here in this paper by uh, Moldin, Sodos, and Williams. And if you want to have a review and uh, basic properties of polyatry, you have the nice papers by, uh, by Lavin here. Okay, but so they are, they are very technical. So I'm going just to define it by construction. What is a polyatry? Uh, to do this, you need a sequence, a sequence of partition. So here I consider, for example, the dyadic partition of the unit interval. So what does it mean? Uh, so let me just show you this here. Uh, 
here at level one of the tree, you have the unit interval. At level uh, at level zero, sorry, at level one, so you have these two dialect partition. So the first is zero one half one half one. At level two, you have this four. So zero one four one half one four yeah and so on. Okay. So this is this we call the dialect partition of the unit interval. So you need this partition. So here you see I just this dialect partition. Level zero, level one, level two, and so on. Okay, you have to do it infinitely. So in theory, <laughs> and so here I consider just the dialectic partition. You have your partition, and you want to construct a random probability measure. To do this, you just have to define sequen sequentially the probabilities. You have to assign a probability to each of uh, of the element of your partition. Okay, you can do this as follow. Here. For example, here, you consider random variable here, W0, and W1, that is one minus W0, okay? And so in a polyatry, these uh, random variables are distributed according to a, bit, uh, a beta distribution, okay? So you sample here a random variable W0 and a W1, and the f of b0 is just w0 and of this of f of b1 is w1 here uh, to move from here to here you also have to sample w00 and w01 that is 1 minus w0 and the f of this b00 is just w00 times w0 okay so yeah that's what this means so how to construct a polyatry on uh, on this unit interval, so that's what is defined it here. So it seems complicated, but it is not. <laughs> okay, so you have to define this. So see, this is just what I explained. Okay, so and you have uh, so you have assigned a mass to each of the element of the partition, and it is called a territory process. It means that these variables are, uh, are mutually independent. This random variable. Okay, so. Doing this, you have defined a random, a random partition. So this is what I mentioned before. In a polyatry, your random variables are independent beta, be, beta random variables. Okay, and this is what I explained here: how to co how to construct uh, the the probability for each of the element of the partition. Okay. So we have to choose the parameter, so these are the parameters for the beta variables, okay? And we have to choose these parameters, so. And these parameters define the, um, the kind of uh, measure you obtain. So if you choose, for example, the parameters to be equal at the left or at the right hand side of the tree, so that's what this means. So you have the expectation of the beta variable that is one half. And if you choose your parameters to depend on the level of the tree, so that's what this means. And so you have this beta variable. And the more this uh, beta variable are concentrated around their expectation, the more regular the random measure is. For example, you have this craft condition. If mu is a Lebesgue measure on, uh, on X, for example, the, the unit interval, you have this craft condition. So if this condition is met, your polyatry um, generates um, uh, random probability measures that admit density with respect to Lebesgue measure. So you have something uh, that is almost purely continuous. So that's what this means. And uh, in the particular case, I have assumed, so if you have this condition, so this condition that is met, for example, for this uh, parameterization of the tree, so you have something that uh, that uh, that admits density with respect to label measure, and here is you have a special case when you have a discrete measure. So if you if you you parameterize your polyatry in this way, the polyatry is a Dirichlet process. So I mentioned that the Dirichlet process uh, is a discrete probability measure. Okay, so you recover the po the, the, the Dirichlet process. Okay, so I hope it is not too technical. <laughs> so, uh, just a last and uh, nice property of the polyatry is its conjugacy property. So, what is important when we are doing Bayesian? What does it mean? If you are, if you have x, x1, xn that are IIDF, okay, uh, 
uh, random probability measure, so an, an f is distributed according to a Collier tree. The posterior distribution, that is f given x, is also a Collier tree uh, with updated parameters. Okay, so that's something, uh, this property is important, for example, uh, for making inference on Collier trees. Okay, so I mentioned that we have to choose the parameters of the beta distribution, and uh, we have also to choose the partition of the space, so we have these uh, two elements to, uh, for, for defining your Collier tree. So in practice, it can be difficult to elicit this partition. So what you can do is to center the Collier tree around a chosen parametric distribution, F0, uh, so which should be F0, and take the partitioning subset pointed with the quantize of F0. So for example here, uh, you can choose your partition uh, as follows. So F0 is just, just a parametric distribution. It can be, for example, the Gaussian distribution. And uh, doing this, so we show that so we have a dual notation where the partitioning space is replaced by F0. And uh, so if F is a random measure generated by a Collier tree, and we choose uh, F0 as follow, so your, your partition element as follow, the, expect the expectation of the random uh, measure is just F0. Okay. And, uh, oops, sorry. Okay, now let me m uh, come back to the test formulation. So I have these two, these two samples, just to recall. I have to compare uh, these two distributions. So I have two samples, x1 from xn1 and uh, y here. And I want to, to test that these distributions are equal versus they are not, okay? So Z is uh, the combined example. Under uh, H0, so under H0, these two distributions are equal, so both samples come from a common distribution. So uh, that is here, if not. Under the alternative hypothesis, I have this, so X that is distributed according to F1, Y according to F2, and these two distributions are different, okay? So I have uh, three uh, random probability measures, F1, F2, and F0. And I put a prior on this uh, tree distribution by considering a Collier tree. Okay. And to choose between these two hypotheses, a Bayesian test evaluates what I mentioned before, the bias factor. So the bias factor is given by this term. Okay. So here the <coughs> you have the prior probabilities of the hypothesis. In uh, the test I consider, so... I assign equal priors to H0 and H1, and the bias factor is just given by the ratio of the posterior odds, and uh, that is given by this, uh, <laughs> this term, and one shows that the bias factor is given, so in the, in the test I consider, the bias factor is given by this product of, uh, of gamma. It just means that the bias factor has an analytic formula for, uh, for, for the test I consider. So that is something that is very important in practice to have a, an explicit formula, okay. Okay, so now, so is application to, to real data. So the data are collected from uh, 58 patients uh, at uh, Orléans Hospital. We have these patients who all uh, suffered a single stroke, a single left hemisphere stroke in the acute phase. And uh, so the mean age of the patient is nine, uh, is here, 19, and the max is 91. And uh, we have here the standard deviation. So we have the last score and a binary lesion mass of each patient. That's what I mentioned before. And uh, so in the... Uh, we are going to compare the proposed Bayesian non-parametric test <laughs> with this frequentist test. The first is the student t-test because that is a reference test in, uh, in the medical studies. And the two uh, frequentist non-parametric tests that are Mann Whitney and uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov. So the significance level for frequentist test is here, 5%. And uh, the number of analyzed voxel is uh, more than 7 million. And uh, here you have the parameterization of the polyatry I have uh, I have proposed. 
and you have this result, okay? So uh, for in each row, you have uh, each of the tests. So this is the, the new test for Bayesian non-parametric uh, by Bayesian non-parametric using polyacry, <laughs> that's what it means, and the frequent history test, okay? So we first look at the results for 58 patients. Okay, uh, so we have, uh, we have here different view of the brain. Uh, you may have a look here to this, uh, to this column. Uh, we must have two separated regions here, here and here, okay? The first, uh, so there are the language areas. The first is the Wernicke area and the other is Borca area. So the neurologist said, not me. <laughs> we have two regions, so we must have two separated regions. So with 58 patients, uh, all the tests recover more or less these two regions, okay? So if you look at what happened if you reduce the number of patients, if you consider 33, uh, 34 patients, we have this. Okay, so let me just explain, I think it is better to show you, to you this result, what happened? Okay, so you have here the tree test and the Bayesian non-parametric, and here's the number of patients. Okay, with 58 uh, patients, we have this, so this is the number of uh, significant voxels, so the number of voxels belonging to language areas, okay? So with 58 patients, that's what I mentioned, all the method locate more or less the classical language areas, so Borca and Wernicke's areas. Uh, yeah, so this region is what I mean. The one is uh, involved in the production of speech and uh, the other one in the, in the receptive issue. Okay, with 58 patients, so all the method locate this uh, region. So what happened with 34? So we can see it here. With 34 patients, only the proposed Bayesian non-parametric test produced stable region, okay? The frequent history test here fail in recovering the total area, so we can see it here. Uh, so the total Wernicke areas for T-test uh, and uh, man with nail, and uh, both areas for Kolmogorov Smirnov, okay? So when we reduce the number of patients, so this method fail in recovering this, uh, these two areas, so. So just to say that it was a good idea to consider a Bayesian non-parametric test. Okay, so just to conclude this part of this work, uh, so we, uh, by developing a new, uh, a new Bayesian non-parametric test, this allows to reduce the sample size, and uh, we have also validated the last test from, from a statistical point of view. Uh, what happened here is that all the computing methods, so the Bayesian non-parametric and the other methods, uh, analyze a voxel independently of, uh, of its neighbor, okay? You just to look at what happened in a voxel, and uh, so to the other voxel, and there is no dependence between, uh, between this voxel, and uh, so it is intuitive that if a voxel belongs to the, to the language array, so it is uh, likely that its neighbor also belongs to the language area, okay? And so we think that a more realistic model should, uh, should uh, include this special interaction among, uh, among a neighboring voxel. Okay, so, and that's what is performed here. Sorry. In this second study with, uh, so that is uh, a research with uh, Nicolas de Bijon. Uh, that is a Bayesian estimation formulation to voxel-based lesion symptom mapping. Mm -hmm. So in this second, uh, second study, what we are going to do is a Bayesian estimation, not a Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian test. So I'm going to explain it. So we have proposed a second approach that is uh, razor different from the, the first one. Okay, so we say that, so we think first that it was, uh, it was uh, interesting to consider a more realistic spatial model that includes this spatial interaction uh, among voxels. And to do this, the task is formulated as a stati statistical estimation problem rather than a testing procedure, okay? Uh, what we are going to do, we are going to estimate the language array directly from the data without resorting to any test, any statistical test. To do this, so this estimation problem is tasked 
in a Bayesian framework, but now we are going to be parametric. So, okay. So just some notation. Uh, we define uh, an observed very binary variable. So this is going to be our variable of interest. Uh, so this is just a binary variable that indicate voxel responsibility. So this binary variable is equal to one if voxel j belongs to the linguage area and zero otherwise. Okay, we want to uh, to determine this uh, this map. And since in the last test, that's what I mentioned before, all the patients with the total score that is less than 15 are ranked as a phasic. So we can just threshold the score. So to do this, we introduce, <coughs> sorry, a diagnosis variable by y n that is given as follows. So it is one if individual n is a phasic and a zero otherwise. Okay. And we have this. Uh, Okay, so we have this uh, Z1, Z uh, and J that equal to one if voxel J in patient N is lesion and zero otherwise. So these variable are then redistributed and we consider this model. So we have this likelihood. So here, uh, Z and J given that uh, voxel J does not belong to, um, voxel J does not belong to linguage area. We have just a Bernoulli, this parameter theta. And here, this means that voxel J belongs to linguage area and the patient is aphasic. And the same here for non-aphasic patient. So we have this, uh, this probability, theta, that is the probability uh, across all subjects that a voxel outside the linguage area is lesion. And uh, theta one, that is the probability, the for lesion pro uh, probability in the language area for symptomatic uh, patient and uh, theta zero the same for non-symptomatic patient. So we have these three uh, probability of lesion and, and now the set of unknown parameters is uh, here, omega, that's what I say, it's our parameters of interest. It is the chart of, uh, of uh, language areas. So we have this, so this is a vector from uh, omega one to omega j, I call that j is the number of voxel. So this is our parameter of interest and this probability lesion. So this three probability lesion. So these are our parameters and we put prior on these parameters. The prior as as follow. For lesion probabilities, we just consider beta distribution, okay? And the parameter of interest to omega I refer to the line of the language areas we want to, to recover. Mm -hmm. So we want to incorporate some dependence. So that's what, we, uh, that's what I mentioned here. So to introduce this dependence, this special correlation between, uh, between neg going voxel, we consider the easing model. So the easing model is given as follow. So it's just uh, the probability of a voxel given the neighborhood is given by this. When this term, uh, sorry, yeah, this term is you know the set of neighboring voxel, and this term promotes a special regularization. So we have this parameter, the the easing uh, field parameter, that is uh, that is the beta. I'm going to talk about. So we can just write the prior for for omega as follows. So it is given by this term. And the parameter beta, the easing field parameter, uh, controls the uh, amount of, of special correlation that is introduced by the, by the Markov random field. And uh, so the, its value, the value of this beta, determines the level of special homogeneity between, uh, between voxel. So if you have a value close to zero, this implies that your voxel are independent. So we consider uh, values of beta that are greater than zero. And uh, so it is well known that for easing model, this uh, normalizing constant is problematic. But so, but it is not problematic uh, if, bears, if beta is known. So, so in this work, the, this value, the value of beta will be fixed uh, and adjusted beforehand. So we don't have to deal with this, uh, with this partition function. And uh, given our prior, inference can be done easily using, uh, using a good sampler. 
uh, the full conditional distribution of, uh, of the probability of lesion are also beta distribution with updated parameters. And the posterior distribution of the Markov random field is also a Markov random field. So we have conjugated properties uh, that uh, simplify the inference. And this uh, second method we propose is also compared with the, full, uh, the fourth Cobius method, the Sudanti test, the Man Whitney and Kolmogorov Smirnov, and uh, the Bayesian non parametric uh, I have proposed before. So we have here the result. Yeah, before the result. <laughs> So the parameters have been chosen as follows. So this means this parameterization of the beta distribution, it's just uh, um, a guesswork fire. So we have no idea, and we don't want to favor any any value of the of the parameter. So we choose something that is nearly uniform. And uh, for the Gibbs sampler, you may uh, notice that this uh, the algorithm converges very quickly. So we don't need a lot of uh, a lot of iteration. And we obtain this, uh, this estimate of the probability of lesion. So that is uh, in accordance in what we expected by the neurologist. And uh, we estimate the, par the parameter of interest using this, so the marginal posterior mode. And we obtain this result. So here, let me recall that <laughs> here in this uh, column, we have the two areas. Broca and Wernicke areas. Okay, so that's what is recovered here. And if you look at this uh, last column, so we have these two methods, these three methods, the Bayesian non-parametric and special is the new one. So I, I noticed, I hope you noticed it, that we obtained something here that is not present here in the other method. So I was desperate. <laughs> And uh, I went to see the doctor, so the neurologist with who I was, and I said, so I don't understand what happened with, uh, with my method, so I don't understand. I have uh, something here that, so I thought that it was not normal to have, uh, to have this region. And so I said to him, I don't understand what happened. So I thought it would work, but it, don't, it doesn't work, so I don't understand what happened. And she said to me, because you have discovered uh, a new region, so a new, a new region that is not Broca and, uh, and Wernicke areas, that is a third region that is also included in, uh, in language areas. So <laughs> yeah, so that's what I mentioned here. So this new method uh, allows to recover, so both areas, but also a third region that is called supramarginal gyrus. So <laughs> OK, so, so I was happy. And, uh, so yeah, by reducing the number of questions, so if you, yeah, so this is what happened with the, with the, with the other test. So the Bayesian non-parametric test recovers the two areas. The frequency test re recovering this area, so what happened in the, in the previous. And the new method allows to recover both areas, but this third, uh, this third region. So I recall that the number of questions is reduced here. And, oops. So just to conclude so this part, so voxel-based lesion symptom mapping is something that is important for, for basic and translational, translational and human uh, neuroscience research. And the classical uh, VLSM studies require individual tests across, uh, across uh, hundreds of thousands of voxels. So, and another li main limitation is what I mentioned. They require a large number of questions. So by proposing something new that is coherent. So this new method allows to outperform the state-of-the-art method when the sample size is reduced, as I mentioned, and also to discover a less uh, well-known uh, language, uh, language area. Okay, just let me say uh, something because I uh, promised to talk about image reconstruction. Uh, just for pet, uh, pet uh, image reconstruction. So it will be very fast. So just to show that you, you can also apply this technique for image reconstruction, not only for, for image processing. Uh, just what is PET? PET positron emission tomography is a, is a functional medical uh, imaging modality 
that is used in uh, oncology, neurology, cardiology, and etc. Uh, to do this, uh, a target molecule is uh, injected into the patient's blood stream, and this molecule is uh, what is called a tracer, so that is uh, a positron emitter radio nuclei. An example in oncology is uh, FDG, that is the analog of glucose, and it uh, allows to explore the possibility of, uh, of cancer metastasis. So, so this radio nuclei decays and emits what is called the positron, and uh, positron is uh, anti-electron. So this positron annihilates with uh, nearby electron, and this uh, produces the emission of two gamma photons moving in the uh, opposite direction. So that's what is uh, depicted here in the data source surrounding the patient. And uh, so the PET scanner is the ring of this uh, individual data source. So when two photons are detected here, so in the data source, in the same time, we say that a coincident is event is recorded here in this, uh, in this virtual line, what is called a law. It is just the virtual line joining both, uh, both detectors in coincidence. Okay, so the aim of PET reconstruction is from all the data that have been collected by, by the detector here to reconstruct the image of the tracer distribution within the body. So this can be performed in a statistic, uh, in a static, not statistical, <laughs> in a static framework or in a dynamic framework. Okay. So uh, just to mention that PET image reconstruction is an inverse problem in which so we, uh, we um, seek to obtain the estimate of the tracer density within, uh, within the subject from the collected event. And it's a very challenging imposed inverse problem. We have here some, uh, some of the problems. So the first one is because a radioactive substance is uh, administered to the patient, so the total number of, uh, of molecules is limited when compared to, to radiological um, X-ray, for example. And the other one is so the limited sensitivity of the camera. We have to deal with the uh, physical and geometrical complexity of scanner, and so there are a lot of problems that, uh, that happen. And the other one is that so, uh, the image quality depends on the, on the injected dose. So here you have uh, different reconstruction, and you may, so this is the first one is a reconstruction uh, under normal dose. Here uh, you see what happens if the dose is divided by 10 and if the dose is divided by 100, okay? So the image quality is, uh, is poor if you, if you reduce the dose. And uh, the aim of this work was to develop new, uh, new image reconstruction method under a low dose. So, and also we wanted to characterize the associated uncertainty because of course, the uncertainty is, uh, is big when we have uh, when we have small number of events. Uh, to do this, so we have performed uh, spatial and uh, spatiotemporal uh, uh, PET reconstruction uh, for cerebral and, uh, and cardiac PET, da PET, PET data. Oops. And uh, what we do is that we view the image we want to reconstruct as a spatial or spatiotemporal probability density, okay? So we are non-parametric, and because we are always Bayesian, we put a prior on this, uh, on this density. Okay, so I don't have time to, to explain it, but well, that's what we do. And the prior we consider as here, Dirichlet process mixture, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in the spatial case, and in the spatiotemporal case, we have dependent Dirichlet polyat, uh, Dirichlet process mixture and polyatry. So we have a lot of challenge to, for example, how to sample infinite dimensional parameters, how to deal with large data size, etc. And you have here, uh, I'm going to show you a video just to explain what is this. Uh, here, uh, it's an example of cardiac data. And the tracer is uh, injected in the patient's arm. So here you have the arm of the patient here. And uh, what happened? Yeah. And this is in the first row, you have the conventional reconstruction. 
in this row, you have the Bayesian non-parametric we propose, and uh, we are at the beginning of Yes. And yes. So you can see the tracer here in the patient and after in the in the uh, in the subsequent organ. So let me just explain what happened. Okay, so so the the tracer is then listed here in the patient arm. So you first see you must see the tracer in the vein of the arm and after uh, in the vena cava, the right ventricle, etc. So what is important here is, for example, we must see here the tracer only in this part. So that is the vein of the arm. So this is not normal. What happened here with the with the conventional reconstruction? This is not normal, okay. So, and you see that okay, you have here, so I have a different frame. What happened here at, he, at this time? Okay, so you have this, uh, this kind of thing at this time. And also, so you have what happened at different times. And also until the end of the exam, we have this kind uh, of, uh, of uh, bias reconstruction that appears in the, in the conventional uh, method. And that does not appear here in the method we propose. Yeah, and the method we propose here, we are here in dose divided by uh, 30. So, yeah, so to say that uh, it works very well. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to conclude. Uh, just if you want, okay, I think I'm going just to do some, uh, some motivation for being Bayesian. Uh, why being Bayesian? So it allows to regularize your, your inverse problem by introducing the, a prior. And it is also a methodological paradigm to go beyond uh, point estimation. Uh, so if you are fully Bayesian, so it allows to have, for example, variance, credible intervals. And this is something very important, for example, for, for medical imaging to, to quantify the, the uncertainty. And uh, why Bayesian non-parametric? So it allows uh, to define and work with the model with large support. So this also sidestep the model selection uh, your problem. It is an active research field and uh, with uh, new models and useful properties. So you have large variety of application of this, uh, of this Bayesian non-parametric. I also mentioned it uh, very quickly, but you also need to, to have efficient sensing schemes for, for very large data set, so that's something we have proposed here in this uh, paper with uh, Eric Barra. And uh, you have a very large number of Bayesian non-parametric models. So I talk about the polyatry, uh, Dirich Le Process, but uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of Bayesian non-parametric model you can use or or you can develop if uh, if you want. And uh, I don't know <laughs> if so. Just want to say. A word about deep learning. Uh, what is the future for Bayesian inverse problem? I don't know. I have <laughs> no answer to this question. But I think it is uh, it is it is interesting to have a look to to what happened in uh, deep learning. I think that uh, yeah, this kind of work. I think it's very interesting. For example, uh, is to develop prior uh, that are based on neural network. So that is what in the what it is what is done here in this paper using a plug and play ADMM. So your prior is uh, defined by a neural network, and you can uh, try to combine these two things, these things, and also being fully Bayesian for uncertainty quantification. So this is uh, something I'm working on uh, at this moment with uh, with. Uh, one of my PhD students. So this is our preliminary results. So here we have uh, 
deep learning problem, so this is the true image, our observation, and something uh, we recover we, uh, we with uh, a, new, a new method we are developing now. So that is uh, really close to the true one. And also, in addition, we also have uh, the standard deviation. So we can also characterize the, the uncertainty of the, of the estimation. So and yeah, and it is also compared to end-to-end -end deep learning method and we obtain a similar performance. And in addition, we also have this, uh, this uncertainty quantification. So we are trying to develop it for, for large uh, inverse problem. And here you have what happened, for example, in, um, um, sorry, <laughs> thank you. You have what happened here in this, uh, in this problem. So we have this. Uh, influencing problem. This observe, this are our observation, and this is uh, uh, what we recover, and also the the uncertainty quantification. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. Are there questions, uh, comments, in the audience? In your first example, it's absolutely unacceptable that uh, the prior was not introducing the possibility of uh, a, s a, a fourth area. Yeah. So yeah. There is a problem with the, with the knowledge at the beginning. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. So that's why. Uh, why we made do by Jean, so to, to introduce this kind of, uh, of information. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the presentation. Short question, the polya trees, are there any relation to Cayley graphs? Because you have some looks like some multiplicative properties. Uh, are there any connection? Any connection to what, sorry? To Cayley graphs. Uh, I, I don't know. Cayley graphs are gra mm -hmm. graphs uh, that encrypt multiplication of groups just as a visual visualization. Uh, so I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's saying. OK. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can, we can t talk yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. So at the, uh, I think the first part, you showed that the method you've developed is more stable, but do you also have like some theoretical result that says that they are also theoretically more stable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's in yeah. the paper. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? I have a remark uh, for the audience more than for the speaker, actually. Uh, for, from my point of view, uh, when I see this uh, conjugacy property is mm -hmm. something that is uh, telling us that the, the space of, of your uh, densities is stable by um, the, this step of uh, using Bayesian. Mm -hmm. um, so I is there a dynamical process behind? Like, can, you, can we understand it as a dynamical system on the probability space. I suppose this is uh, the, the case. I don't know if someone knows more about this. So uh, a geometrical point of view of what you're doing um, on this space of probability okay, densities. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe. Prob yeah. Probably there's something like this. Yeah, I think so. Are there other questions? So if not, uh, please uh, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you.